Great. Well, it's great to be back. Uh, we love, my whole family loves to be in Tucson here, and congratulations to the Russell family. I want to say thank you, uh, Brother Russell, for allowing me to come down here and preach to you today and also the times in the past. Uh, <coughs> uh, the part I want to focus on here, you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, look down at the bottom at verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. And the title of my sermon is, What It Really Means to Speak with Tongues. And you can see right here, the Bible says, Forbid not to speak with tongues. And you might be thinking, Wait, Brother Jake, are you about to tell us that the Bible says we should speak in tongues? Or, you know, forbid not to speak in tongues? Well, <laughs> yes, I am. But what does it mean to speak in tongues? What does it really mean to speak in tongues? And that's what we're going to look at today. And this sermon needs to be preached because right now, you know, Sunday morning, 2020, December 13th, 2020, right now there are probably thousands of Pentecostal, charismaniac churches that are meeting right now, you know, in the house of God, which, you know, it's not a house of God, and they're making a mockery of, of the Lord's house, making a mockery of what really should be happening in church with all their babblings and hoopty doopties and whoopsie whoopsies and you know, this, this silly, foolish language, you know, it's baby speak. It means nothing. And it's, it's, it needs to be preached because these people meet at, 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 at the same time. They meet on Sundays. They call themselves Christians. Maybe you've been out there knocking on doors, and you knock on someone's door, and they say, uh, you know, I'm a Pentecostal, and I speak in tongues. And, you know, how do you know you're saved? Well, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I roll around on the ground. And I had a lady once tell me, you know, I'm a holy roller. And you know, she, she meant that she rolled on the ground in the church and made the church a circus. And that's exactly what we do not want to have happen here. But the Bible says, forbid not to speak with tongues. So we're going to look at what that means today. And we're going to teach, I'm going to try to show you this doctrine of what it actually means to speak with tongues. And uh, we're going to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, put a bookmark there. We're going to come back at the end, uh, since that's the crystal clear uh, scripture here. And the Bible has a lot to say about this subject, so it's crystal clear. But turn with me to the very first book of the, of the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 1. The, we're talking about, you know, what does it mean to speak with tongues? And, and, and in a nutshell, it's to speak with a different language. That's it. You know, <laughs> that's the end of it. Close the, close the book. It's to speak in a different language. To speak with different tongues means different languages. And let's look at this. So go to Genesis chapter 11. Now, in the beginning, of course, God created Adam and Eve, and he gave them language. God invented language, which, you know, shows us the mind, the beauty, the power of God to invent a language. You know, I'm struggling just to learn one language, English. I failed Spanish multiple times in high school and eventually passed in college. But, you know, it's hard to learn a language. Now, imagine inventing a language. Imagine inventing, you know, a, a, a language that was going to be used for, you know, throughout all history. And God invented way more than that. You know, there's over 7,000 different languages being used today, and God invented all those. I mean, he, he orchestrated them all. And so to speak in tongues simply means to speak in the language. But go to Genesis chapter 11. Let's look at verse number 1. I want to show you a brief history lesson of language and show you here that God created the languages, and he uh, can do whatever he wants with the language. So we're going to look here. This is Genesis chapter 11. Starting in verse 1, this is the story of the Tower of Babel and the city of Babel. Uh, let's start reading. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. That means there's only one language, you know, there wasn't two languages, only one. Verse 2, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and lime they had for, for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the, Lord, and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. 
and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And we can stop there. So this is a wonderful story. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. And let me just break it down for you. Basically, all the people were one language, and they had, a, you know, they, they had organization. They had one language. They had a common language to help them communicate. And they said, hey, let's do something great. And they decided to build a giant tower, and they're going to you know, climb up to heaven, I guess, you know, this big tower. And God looks down from heaven, and he says, wow, you know, it's, you know, the earth is going to continue for a lot longer, and they're already doing this mighty act now. You know, I'm, I'm sure he thought, what are they going to do you know, 5,000 years from now, you know, in 2080, after Jesus and all that stuff? And so God said, we're going to confound their language. And what that meant is that you know, all of a sudden, imagine being on a construction site, you know, you're working and you're, you've got the, the wood and the, the hammer and the nail and you're saying, hey, hold that right there for me, brother. He says, okay. And then all of a sudden it's, nong, chong, 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 chong. <laughs> you'd be like, what the heck is happening? You know, I told you to hold, you know, hold the board there and you hit your hand or something and, ah, you know, it, it would really ruin the job site. Talk about worker safety. I mean, it would really be a dangerous environment to work at. And it's so interesting because I knew a person, he used to go to our church, but I met this person, and, and they were complaining to me that they got hired on. He was an electrician, and he got hired on to this, uh, you know, work site where everybody spoke a different language than him, than he did. And it, it was so funny because he kept complaining about, you know, I don't, my boss doesn't like me. I never know what to do. I'm always failing. He tells me to do something, and I think I understand him, and then I do something. I think I do what he does, and he's mad because I didn't do it the right way. And I, I wanted to be like, you're a Christian. The Bible says if you can't speak the language on the, the same language on the job site, how are you going to do anything, you know, good or be productive or, you know, you should you should learn their language. You know, you should learn the other language just because it's so confusing to be you're receiving instructions in different languages. And so you can see here that God did this. And, you know, it's interesting because we have over 7000 different languages on the earth today. And I had to Google that term and I thought that's pretty high. I, I was like, I didn't think so. I, I thought there'd be like seven, <laughs> you know, just to show my ignorance. 7,000 languages currently being in, in use today. And if you break it down by different countries or different continents, you know, the whole continent of Africa, I think, had 2,000 languages just on that one continent. And if anything, the, you know, Europe was probably the least. Europe had like 4% of the world's languages just in Europe. But these other continents had so many more languages. And so I'm saying this because there's this concept of an extinct language where Latin, for example, nobody speaks Latin today, even though it's still a language and you can study Latin. And, you know, if you were to study plants and animals, usually there's, you know, a Latin name for those things. But Latin is, a, is what we call a dead language. It's extinct. People don't speak Latin anymore. And many other languages today, I, I read last night that one third of the languages that are spoken today are at risk of being extinct as well. And so just imagine here, you know, all the way back in time, we're talking Genesis, you know, chapter 11, just how many languages, if these languages aren't being invented, they're only being extincted or extinct. Sorry, that's not a word. The question is, how many languages did God have there? You know, there'd be thousands and thousands and thousands of languages. Google Translate, for example, has 103 languages right now. So if you wanted to use Google Translate, that gives you 103 you know, options of 7,000 languages. That's very, they're just skimming the surface at that point. And so <coughs> go ahead and turn to, well, go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 28. But while you're turning, I'll read for you a few more verses here. So, uh, you know, Psalm 81 is a beautiful psalm. We actually sing this song. Uh, psalm 81.5, This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language that I understood not. I've got the tune wrong. But he understood, he didn't understand the language. When Joseph went to Egypt, he didn't understand the language. And if anybody's been to a different country or something and you realize that you're the only English speaker there, it's kind of like, what do I do? And, and you think, you know, if I needed help right now, I don't even know what to say. You know, help me, help me, help me. You know, what is that in, in Chinese? Or what is that in some other language? You know, you'd have to learn those words. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Genesis 42, 23, uh, talking about Joseph, and they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. If you ever speak to somebody who speaks a different language and you don't speak their language, you need an interpreter to interpret the language for you. It's interesting because I, 
when I was uh, really, really young, I went on a missions trip with a non-denominational church, and I'll say missions trip, but we went to China, and we spent two weeks in China, and we went around, and we didn't preach the gospel at all, and I don't believe I was saved until much later in life. In fact, what we did do is we, my job as a teenager was to hold my finger to the reading test, and I would point to the big E, and then to the, to the letter C, and then the letter A, and I just, like you flew me around the world to point to a reading exam. It was, it was just, that's a whole other sermon in itself. But I remember they, they put me up there, and I was just a kid. I mean, I was probably 14 years old. And they put me up there, and I got to speak it to 200 Chinese people. And I would speak something, and then I'd have to pause, and the interpreter would come and speak and, and basically say what I said. And I have no idea what I said. I mean, you know, I'm sure the interpreter probably filled in a lot of the, of the missing gaps there, as that was my first time public speaking to 200 Chinese people. But the point is, is that you need that interpreter there because without the interpreter, you have no clue what they're saying. I mean, you could, you could do body language and mime things and, you know, talk about the bird or whatever, but that's about it. You're lost without the interpreter. And so God confounded language. You know, he gives the language and he takes it away. He gives it and he, and he confused it. Uh, he scattered them. He confounded it. So that's kind of a history of language. Let's go to, you're there in Isaiah chapter 28. Uh, look at verse 9. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. I want to show you that there's a prophecy of speaking in new tongues related to the New Testament. We have the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. We have the New Covenant. I want to show you this. <clears throat> this is kind of a famous uh, verse. You, you probably have heard this from other, other sermons in the past. But Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Oops, one second. Verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest, therewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing that ye would not hear. But the word of the, or jump down to verse 13, oh, you're there already. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Now jump down to verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. So what's, what's being said here? This is a famous passage. This is talking about, you know, basically back in Isaiah, this is, you know, Israel at this time is pretty much destroyed. Judah's getting destroyed with uh, Babylon. And God's saying here through Isaiah that he's going to start over. Line upon line, precept upon precept. He says, who, who shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make under, to understand doctrine? He's talking about bringing in, ushering in the New Testament, ushering in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And that's specifically listed there in verse 16. I lay in Zion a foundation, for a foundation, a stone. The stone is Christ, Jesus, the New Testament. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And he that believeth shall not make haste. Again, referring to the New Testament, believing on Christ, the sure foundation. Now, this isn't crystal clear. If you're looking for salvation verses, obviously go to the book of John or, you know, New Testament verses. But this is an Old Testament prophecy of the New Testament, of, you know, the, the new covenant. Now, verse 11 is what I want to focus on. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. This is basically referring to the, to the fact or, or, or to the idea that the Jews had first dibs at understanding the gospel. They, Jesus preached to the, to the Jewish people for three and a half years. He was then crucified. They said, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be on us and on our children. And then they moved to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles received Christ very readily. They, they received him very easily, low-hanging fruit, so to speak. And the Gentiles were moved, and, and Paul kind of has this theme. Basically, he's trying to move the Gentiles to bring the Jews to jealousy, to, to say, oh, the Jews want what, what the Gentiles have. You know, God has replaced the kingdom of Israel with Christians, with Christianity, with the New Testament. The Old, the Old Testament has waxed away. And so this is basically spoken out 
or, or, or listed here as with another tongue will he speak to this people. And that's referring to the tongues of you know, non-Hebrew speakers, the tongues of the non-Jewish people at that time. They were talking about the Greek and, you know, I guess the Latin or, you know, many, many other languages, which we'll see in a second, all those listed out. So this is prediction of the New Testament, making the, trying to make the Jews jealous. And it's really interesting here because in the big picture, if you zoom out of what's being said, if you're wrong about Jesus Christ, if you're wrong about this foundation, this cornerstone, you're probably wrong about the Jews as well, the nation of Israel. If you're wrong about Jesus and you're wrong about the Jews, you're probably wrong about the doctrine of tongues. You're probably up there going doopty doopty, hop de loopty. You know, I'm trying to make some sound. You know, ba ba doo boo doo. It's it's nonsense. It's just baby speak. It's babbling. That's what they're doing. And so, isn't it interesting that these are all connected? And you could almost make the argument that a lot of these churches are this way, obviously because they're not saved. That's that's crystal clear. But it's kind of like speaking in tongues doctrine is somehow connected to being wrong in Israel. And being wrong on Israel can be connected to being wrong on Jesus Christ, of course, wrong on, on the New Testament or some aspect of that. And, you know, I'm just, you know, skimming the surface there of, of really the deep complexity there. Go ahead and go to the New Testament. Let's go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Mark chapter 16. Because Jesus himself prophesies or, or, or predicts that uh, in the future they're going to speak with new tongues. So we'll take a look at this. Mark chapter 16 is the very last chapter in Mark. This is when Jesus is giving the Great Commission. The Great Commission to go and preach the gospel to all the nations. Mark chapter 16 verse 15 the Bible reads, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. What a great ending. So Jesus himself is saying here, you know, he's basically giving us a clue that he's going to send out the apostles. And the apostles can do these signs. They can cast out devils in his name. They speak with new tongues. You know, we'll talk about what that means. That means speak with multiple languages at once. They shall take up serpents. You know, Paul was stuck, you know, uh, was bitten by the serpent, and he was fine. And the barbarian, the barbarous people, the barbarians, they thought, wow, you know, he's a god. And they tried to worship him, and he said, no, no, don't worship me. Lay, ha lay hands on the sick. You know, Peter laid, laid hands on the sick, uh, many sick people, and they, they would be healed instantly. These are signs of the apostles. And one of these signs is they shall speak with new tongues, speaking with a new language. And, and that's exactly what we see here. So the question is, what actually happened on the day of Pentecost? Go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2. What actually happened on the day of Pentecost? And uh, this is important because, you know, the most famous church uh, denomination out there, and I, I hate to even call them a church. I want to call them a cult or, you know, some wicked false church. But these Pentecostals, sometimes they're called the Charismaniacs. And from my experience, I've been at even non-denominational churches that speak in tongues. Uh, for example, uh, the Bethel Church, which they say means house of God. Uh, even though the, they weren't speaking in tongues in the congregation, many of the people there at the, the church that I you know, attended off and on uh, as an unsaved person was uh, non-denominational. But on the drive to the church, they would speak in tongues going to church. It was so strange. They'd pick me up, and I'm just, you know, just average guy going to church with some friends. And in the car, they're like, Jake, do this. And, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, no way, I'm not doing that. That's too weird. And many times in my life, you know, as I was constantly seeking, trying to get saved, trying to find the gospel, you know, and I, you know, I hate to say it, but I spent time at this one church called the Vineyard Church, the Vineyard in Tempe, where they would do these crazy things rolling on the ground and they'd do fire tunnels where they'd, you know, the women would come and, and they'd lean against each other like this. You're supposed to run through, ah! It was a circus. It was crazy. 
And I remember thinking, this place is dark. They had to dim the lights. You know, praise God that we keep the lights bright in here. You know, praise God that the lights are on in the church. You know, amen. And that's both, you know, mentally and spiritually or physically. So these churches and, and you know, at, at Pentecost or at, um, at the vineyard, they were constantly trying to get me to speak in tongues, constantly trying to get me to do it. And I thought, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And I remember thinking, like, you know, if this is real, because remember, I'm unsaved. This is many years ago. But I remember thinking, either these people, like, this is weird and creepy, or they're faking it. And sometimes I could tell, like, that guy's, like, maybe you're a legit person, but this guy's for sure faking it. Like, this guy's just saying the same syllable, you know, ba 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 ba. You know, he's not saying anything. And I remember thinking, like, I just want to know what's true. I want to know the truth. And I remember, I resolved to myself, I thought, I am not going to fake it no matter what. And one day, they, they, they had all the people doing their crazy hooligans, shenanigans, and that main, you know, reprobate, heretic, uh, devil guy who was the leader of the church, he came, and he put his, he's got his mic, and he's like, all right, Jake, this is your time, and he put his hands on me like this, right? And I remember thinking, like, this guy's going to try to get me to do something crazy. And I was closing my eyes, and he's like, you know, receive the Holy Ghost. You know, he's like, do, do, do. And I remember thinking like, uh-uh, buddy. I'm, I'm in my head, I'm like, no way. And he, he's pushing on me. You know, he's pushing on me, trying to knock me down on the ground like Benny Hinn, you know. Oh. And I remember thinking, no, you know, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I was fighting back against this guy. And it, I mean, it was weird and it was bizarre. And it's the kind of church that had drums, you know, that bum, 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 bum. bum. And it's just, it's, that's devilish. It's not of the Spirit. You know, these people would lose their minds. They would come back, and they wouldn't know what happened. And you say, well, okay, show me that in the Bible. <laughs> where, where is this in the Bible? And it's so strange, because even though I had read, at that time I was unsaved, I had read the New Living Translation, cover to cover, four times, which is really bizarre that I would do that. But I remember, I, I remember thinking, if I could read, if I know what's here... Then I know what's not there. And I learned this as a very young person. If you know what's here, then nobody can try to convince you of something that's not there. And I thought, where is this? And, you know, we hate these false Bibles and the King James is the Word of God. Amen. And, you know, it was an eye-opening experience to realize that the NLT Bible I was reading was missing all the verses, missing 16 verses. And I thought, throw this in the garbage. It's not even the Bible. I, I used to tell people I read the Bible cover to cover. And it's like, well, it's missing verses. How could you read it cover to cover? So, you know, get rid of that thing. But, you know, Acts chapter 2 is in the NLT Bible, and they don't have people foaming at the mouth either. I mean, they're not rolling around either. And I remember thinking, this isn't in any Bible that I've ever read ever, as an unsaved person. And I just believe that, you know, even though I was unsaved, I believe that God must have known that later in life I was going to get saved. And I believe that God was protecting me because... You know, I don't want you, you know, young kids to get the wrong idea. You should not go to these Pentecostal churches. Now, I believe if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, you can't be messed with. But, you know, in general, do not go to these places because they're, you know, it's an unclean spirit. They're getting filled with devils foaming at the mouth. And, you know, I, well, let's, let's dive into the text here. So the question is, what actually happened on the day of Pentecost? Because if you ask the Pentecostals, where is this in the Bible? They'd say, oh, Acts chapter 2. Well, let's read Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came the sound from heaven, a rushing, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. Now, what is a cloven tongue as a fire? It's going to be some kind of... So I'm, I'm imagining some kind of like smoke thing, some kind of cloven tongue as a fire. It's, they're seeing, you know, the Holy Spirit. They're seeing it. So don't expect to understand what that looks like, but that's what the Bible says. They saw it. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And as the Spirit gave them utterance, and there, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, Every nation. That's like saying all, all nations under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, 
Are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Let's stop there. So here's what's happening. Let, let me, don't miss this. What's happening is, it's very simple. The, the men, are, they're up there preaching, right? It, it'd be as if, pretend here that everybody here speaks a different language from one another. You all speak a different, you know, your native language. And because everybody speaks different languages, you know, that's why you try to speak in English. If everybody has a second language as English, you try to speak in English. But pretend for a second that that, you know, nobody spoke the same language. And, you know, for me, I only speak English. I, <laughs> I don't, don't ask me to speak that language. It's not good. So imagine me standing up here speaking, you know, the sermon, talking to you all. And each person's hearing it in their own language. It's not like there's an interpreter, like where, you know, I'd be saying, you know, you know, hello. And someone would be saying, <laughs> like, like the airplane it, when, we fly to, when we went to China, they would give the announcements, right? They would do the, who, you've been on an airplane where they do like the seatbelt and they click the thing and they do the little flight attendant thing. Well, they had to do that like three times, you know, one in each language. But imagine that you would speak in English and everybody would hear in their own language. As if the words are being, you know, translated in the air themselves. Like, I'm sending you hello. You're hearing hola. You know, be like, how are you? Como estas? You know, it'd be like instant translation. Now, this is something that has never existed you know, until, you know, modern times where you'd have, you know, some sort of translating device or people use their smartphones, you know, Google Translate where you can speak to it instantly. But that's, you know, this is technology. This is using databases. And it's interesting. I learned that Google Translate operates by searching the Bible. The Bible is one of its key uh, uh, database uh, comparisons because the Bible has been translated into just about every single language. So isn't that interesting? But so here's what's happening. One person speaking in only one language, and instantly it's being communicated in every language from every nation. What a miracle. Now, why would God want this to happen? Why would God allow this to happen? Well, the answer is, is really clear. To get people saved, to teach people the, the gospel so they could go out and spread. Time is of the essence. We don't have time to find a translator. We don't have time to, to you know, get someone and do word-for-word -word comparison and translation and all this stuff. He wanted it instantly. Spread it out. You know, that, that gospel fire has got to be burning over the whole earth. And so if you're a soul winner in the room, you can understand this. At least I could understand this because sometimes you go out soul winning, and you knock on the door, and the person answers the door, and they look so receptive. They say, oh man, you know, I'm, I, how do I go to heaven? I've been praying for it. And they're so receptive, but the problem is they don't speak your language. They speak a different language. And for me, you know, the answer is, Jake, if you want to get more people saved, you've got to learn Spanish. You know, that, the very receptive Spanish culture around here, or at least up in Phoenix, but around here too. But the point is, is that imagine knocking at the door, and, you know, door, what's behind door number one? Door number one is a Spanish person. Well, great, I speak Spanish. Boom, I'll get you saved. Door number two, a very receptive French person. This has happened where I've knocked on a door here in Phoenix, and a French person, they only spoke French. It was like French-Canadian. They only spoke French. They didn't speak any English. They knocked, I knocked on the door, and boom, it'd be like getting that person saved too. It's very receptive. And many times, you know, I'm talking about this as if it did happen. This didn't happen. But it would be great if it would happen. What a spiritual gift to just knock on any door and no matter what, language was not a barrier for you. Wouldn't that be a spiritual gift? You'd be a soul winning machine. And if God gave you such a gift, he would almost, you know, he would expect you to be a soul winning machine. And that's exactly what we see here where these people have this gift. They're getting everybody saved, which will later on we'll see that 3,000 people were saved at that same time. So let's keep reading. Now, for this next part, I'm, I'm going to ask for a volunteer. I'm going to need someone to help me, uh, help me read, or not read, but to help me count. You wanna, can you help me, brother? Come on, come on down. So we're going to read in verse 9. Now, here's what I want to do. What we're going about to read is I'm going to read all these, these, uh, these, these are different languages, regions. All I want you to do is use your hands, and I want you to count how many languages there are. We're going to count the languages. Now, I'm doing this so I can focus on reading and you can count them, okay? So all you have to do is hold your hands up high and you count them. And you guys can count there too. Ready? So let's start in verse 8. And how, how hear we, we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Here we go. Number one, 
the Parthians, and the Medes, and the Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Carpadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phygeria, Pam Pamphylia, in Egypt. How many are you up to? Eleven. Eleven. <laughs> you need another hand. <laughs> And in the parts of, the, of Libya, about Kyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, how do we hear them speak in our tongues and in the wonderful works of God? And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? So how many did we have? Seventeen. Seventeen. Oh, go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Seventeen languages. I couldn't do it all in my own hands. Seventeen different languages are listed right here. So understand what's happening. Thank you for coming up. They're preaching in one language. They're hearing it in every language. The Bible lists 17 different languages. Where is the, the you know, hoopty doopty whoopsie, you know, where is the, the animal sounds? Where is the, the funny, you know, barking like a dog? Where is it? It's not here whatsoever. You know, I thought about different ways I could do this. I, I thought about having... You know, one person come up every time I said a language. You know, one person come up and stand up here. And, of course, that would be just about everybody in the whole church. But that's a thing. I mean, just so you can understand, that's 17 different languages. 17 is listed. But the Bible says just a few verses up higher that every nation under heaven. This is a key moment in history, a key moment in time. Why? <laughs> Let, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's give the Pentecostal the benefit of the doubt. Let's just pretend that it is, you know, barking like a dog, making chicken sounds, making all sorts of nonsense. How does that help the gospel? How does that do anything good? And if you know anybody who goes to these Pentecostal churches, they don't do any soul winning. They don't go door to door. They don't do anything like that. If they do, they go out on the street and they try to heal people and make their ankles grow the same length, <laughs> you know, which is so stupid. <laughs> Have you, has anybody seen that before where they... They get you and they try to make your ankle, oh, they say, well, this leg here is a little too short. We're going to pull it back out. And all that's happening is the guy, the guy's, he's pulling on the guy's hips. You know, I don't know if you can, my legs aren't getting longer, friend. You know, it's so stupid. So 16, uh, 17 different languages are, are listed there. 17 different languages. Where is the rolling around? Let's keep reading. Verse 13. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Verse 15. For these are not drunken, as ye, su as ye su suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. That basically means it's 8 or 9 a.m. in the morning. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days that, uh, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my husbandmen I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So what happened on this day? What happened on Pentecost? 3,000 people were saved that day. 3,000 people. Imagine being at that event, seeing 3,000 people get saved. In one day, that's a lot of people. Did anybody roll on the floor? No. Did anybody foam with the mouth? Ah, <laughs> no. Did anybody bark like a dog, clock like a chicken? I've seen, you know, churches where people do that. I've seen them where they bark on the, on the ground. Did anybody run around like they were physically on fire? No. <laughs> help me, help me, I'm on fire. No. That's not biblical. These churches are making a mockery. They're laughing at you. You know, it's, it's like demons are laughing at these people, making them bark like dogs, cluck like chickens. It's, a, it's, it's really sad is what it is. But they get what they deserve because they reject the gospel. Now, I think that people probably go there. You know, there's false teachers in there that are the most wicked. But unfortunately, it's, it's a trap. And people probably wander in there off the street just like I did. I had a friend that invited me. Oh, come to church with me. I said, okay, why not? But I remember thinking, you know, I'm not going to fake this. This is too weird. Why do they dim the lights down? And while I'm on this church, th I'm speaking specifically of, of the Vineyard Church in Tempe, the Vineyard, which is such a silly name, Vineyard. What does that have to do with the Bible at all? The Vineyard, you know, it's like all about drinking wine. 
But the Vineyard Church, this lady told me, she's, she, she's in the church, right? Just imagine just having a church service like this and, and you know, uh, Pastor Julie was preaching. This church is a mess. <laughs> Pastor Julie's up there preaching and this lady stands up and she goes, Arr! God just told me that this time next year, 333 people are going to be in the service. I remember, ooh, 333, like halfway to 666. Interesting. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? But I remember thinking, like, okay, today's day. I was like, all right, put it on the calendar. You know, and one year goes by, and I had already left the church at that point, but I still had communication with my friend who went there, who's not my friend anymore. But I talked, I said, hey, it's been one year. How many people are in attendance? Oh, about the same. You know, it was like 50 people or so. You know, it wasn't that much. I was like, what did that lady get kicked out for making this prophecy that didn't come true at all? She said, the Lord spoke to me. And this time next year, 333 people. I'm like, well, that's a man-made number. They didn't come. These people are just complete, just, just lying, 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 or filled with devils. And again, they had the drums, and they had the fire tunnel. And I went to this church once and just to visit in, in Anaheim, California, and you know, men during the worship time when, when they had the, the women and, and mini skirts up there singing and dancing and, you know, doing all that you know, microphone, you know, stuff and on whatever. Uh, the men came down, they took their shoes off, which is really strange. I think they thought it was holy ground. They took their shoes off and they took these ribbons and they're running around men, full grown men running with ribbons, twisting and twirling around. It was like cheerleading practice. I'm thinking... Where is that in the Bible? That's not here at all. Ribbon running. What in the world? What does this have to do with anything? They brought up a, a painting easels, and they're up there painting. <laughs> this, is a, this is stupid, and they're making fun of Christians. I mean, this, this is not good, and this need, it needs to be stopped, and that's why this sermon is very relevant. And so you could say... You know, one of the things that they would try to say is like, well, speaking in tongues, it's, it's, it's a heavenly language. You can't understand it. It's just, it's, it's a heavenly language. Well, let's just take a quick look at what is a heavenly language. Go ahead and flip to, the, to Revelation, the very last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 7. They say, well, it's, it's a heavenly language. You can't understand it. I'm, and they try to pawn it off like they're so spiritual. Well, cluck, 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 bark, 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 woof, woof, woof. I'm so holy. <laughs> no doesn't work like that. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7. Now, for some context, this is Revelation chapter 7. It's just after chapter 6. Chapter 6 is where we see the, the rapture happen. Uh, it happens in chapter 6 where God basically raptures his church. This hasn't happened yet. And at the same time in chapter 6, God starts pouring out his wrath. And that's because the day of the Lord is the same day, which is a whole other sermon. But the day of the Lord is basically God saving his people and God judging the non-believers at the same time, at the start of it. Chapter 7 is where we see evidence of this. Chapter 7, verse 9, uh, let's start reading. <clears throat> and after this I beheld, and lo, this is John speaking, by the way. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with wh white robes and psalm and and palms in their hand, hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessed, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And we can stop reading there, but did you see in verse 9 where it says, every kindred and people and tongues, every tongue, every language will be in heaven? Now, this is really interesting because if you basically do the math here, it just says right there. So, you know, is there, is there a, a heavenly language that only angels speak? You know, I'm, I'm going to say no. No, there's not. You know, is there a heavenly language? Let's just say there is. Let's just pretend for a minute that there is a heavenly language that only angels speak. And that language is, you know, it's not Greek. It's never been spoken on, on earth, but it's only spoken in heaven. And I'm not, I want to be careful because I do believe that God could, you know, in heaven make a new language. And maybe that does exist. But what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, we know for a fact that on earth in 2020, there are over 7,000 languages today. 
being spoken today. I mean, that's what Google said. 7,000 languages. I could maybe identify Spanish, French, Chinese, you know, Mandarin, maybe Italian. I could identify maybe four of them. But let's just say that, you know, language number 6,999 was spoken, you know, in heaven, and, and let's just say the Pentecostals are right, that it actually is a heavenly language. What I'm trying to say is how in the world would they know? If you come, to, if you come speaking to me in language number 6,999, some random language that I've never even known existed, I thought there was only seven languages. I was surprised at 7,000 languages. How would you even know if that's the language that's heavenly or not? How would you know? Unless you knew every other language, how could you, how could you on earth as a human being know that you know, some language that you're clucking like a dog or whatever, you know, uh, a, a chicken, how could you even know that that's a heavenly language? It makes no sense. I mean, it, there's no way you could even prove that. Unless you spoke every other language, then you could know. Does that make sense? There's no way you could know. You, you, could, it could, you could think it's a heavenly language, and it turns out it's actually just that clicking uh, language that, that they speak in Africa, that, the clicking sounds that the tribes do, you know, the I can't do it that well. How would you know it's a different language? Uh, it's a heavenly language. What authority would you have? The Bible says that there's every language in heaven. On the rapture, every language, every tongue, every nation's in heaven. So how could you possibly know? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at, at 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14. Let's flip back to where we started. Because the Bible is crystal clear on this. Crystal clear on, on what to do with speaking in, in tongues and how to handle it and what to do and what the doctrine is. And just like what we've already shown and what we've already proved, it has nothing to do with running around and making a mockery of the house of God. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. So go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14. And actually turn back one page or one chapter to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll start there. Because Paul spoke with tongues. Paul spoke with many different languages. <clears throat> and the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, oh, interesting, and have not charity, I am, become, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkle, tinkling cymbal. What is, what is the sound of a sounding brass? That'd be like tinkling cymbal, you know, something like that. But did you notice how it says here, the tongues of men and of angels? Oh, angels, heavenly language, is that what it's saying? No, I, I don't think so, but it, first of all, angel just means messenger. And this has been proven many times in the past. I, I don't have time to prove it here, but angel just means messenger. Now, there are angels that are human, and there are angels that were non-human. And, and if anybody has questions on this, Pastor Anderson himself preached an excellent sermon, two sermons, angels that are human and angels that are non-human. And angel just means messenger. And actually, just recently, I think in last Wednesday's sermon, Pastor Anderson mentioned that, you know, angel is just a preacher at the same time, you know. You could say that I'm acting as an angel, you know, giving the message. The preacher's preaching the message. And, and, and an angel carries a message. He's a messenger. But there are angels that are human. There are angels that are non-human. Now, we've already covered the, the human side of things where, you know, and I've tried to cover this in the past, where if somebody died, a saved person from the Old Testament died, went to heaven. Let's call that person Gabriel, for example. Now, I'm just making this name up, but Gabriel... He's an angel that we know of in the New Testament, Gabriel. If that angel, Gabriel, came back to earth with a message and started speaking in some other language, you'd have no clue if it's the heaven-only language or if it's just, you know, language number, you know, whatever extinct language had already passed, you know, language number 6,999. You'd have no way of knowing. But let's just say that it is a, an angel that's non-human. We're talking about the cherubim or the seraphims. The cherubim, seraphim, you know, those angels are, are non-human, so they're very difficult to understand what they are. I would compare them to just an animal. And it's logical to assume that the cherubims and the seraphims talk to one another, and if they had another language, it could be another language other than a human language because they're non-human. So either way you look at it, you know, the, the, how you interpret this first, it doesn't really matter because... Paul is saying, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He's saying, hey, listen, even though you can speak all these different languages, you're so fancy, 
And even though you can speak of even languages of angels, what does that mean? Either, either the one hand, the human angels, or the non-human angels. He's saying none of that matters if I don't have charity. And this is often translated you know, as love or something like that, you know, charity, having charity for one another. And so what I'm trying to show here is just which is better. There's a comparison. The Pentecostals will have you say, well, unless you speak in tongues, you're not even saved. <laughs> What Paul is saying, like, is that the right attitude to have? Oh, you have to speak in tongues? I mean, the, never mind the false doctrine. Is it that such a great a thing? It's, it's not better than having charity. Charity is clearly better than that. So don't feel too bad if you only speak one language like I do. Have charity, and you're already doing better off than speaking all these different languages. I mean, that's what the Bible says. So go ahead and flip one chapter over. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and let's learn about how we should behave ourselves in the church. And we're going to take a look at this. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, follow, verse 1, Follow after charity and, dis and despise spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he's saying, but rather that ye may prophesy, meaning, yes, it's good to speak in other languages. It's a good thing. Desire it. Desire spiritual gifts. But rather, but even better than that, is being able to prophesy. And what does it mean to prophesy? It simply means to preach, uh, to, to exhort people, to to preach the word, to preach the gospel, you know, even door to door, to prophesy. It doesn't necessarily always mean prophesying, you know, of future events, like setting dates <laughs> or setting some kind of rapture date. And the best example I have of that is the very beginning of Proverbs chapter 31, where it says, uh, uh, the words of uh, t t the prophesy which King Lemuel's mother taught him. So King Lemuel, a nickname for Solomon, was taught him. The mother was prophesying, teaching her child and we list, it lists all the things that he taught him, which is, you know, to obey the law, to not drink alcohol, and best of all, how to find a godly woman. So that would be a prophecy, which is basically like a, like a sermon or like a, 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 a topic, a, to preach a doctrine, to teach something. Jump down to verse 3. But he that prophesied speaketh unto all men to edification and to exhortation and to comfort. And he that speaketh in another in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Here's, here's what this is saying. It's better to be able to speak and to prophesy to edification, that means to teach someone, to exhortation, that means to motivate people and motivate them to go soul winning or to motivate them to live a clean life. And comfort. What would it look like to preach to someone about comfort? Well, the best example I can have of this is uh, at Faithful Word, you know, every now and then, God forbid, we have to have some sort of uh, funeral service. It's a very sad time. Maybe, you know, God forbid, it, you know, a child or, you know, better is, is when a really elderly person who's lived a long, fulfilling life, you know, they go to be with the Lord. It's a very a happy time at that time. But there's still times there when, when I've seen Pastor Anderson, you know, even though he speaks so many different languages, you know, and he speaks a lot of languages, and he's so wise in a lot of ways, there's that time at that very moment when he's preaching the, the eulogy or, or the, during the funeral, whether it's graveside or in the church, when he speaks words of comfort. And I remember just sitting there thinking, like, these are just so comforting words. And, you know, th there's just that time there. And what Paul is saying is that it's better, instead of speaking in all these different languages, being so cool with all your different languages, it's better to be able to, to edify people, to exhort people, and to comfort people. And so that's what we should do, and that's what we should, that's what the Bible's saying is better than speaking in all these different languages. Speaking languages is good, but being able to do this is better. Verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. He, what he's basically saying is that speaking a different language is only the, it's like the medium to be communicated. It doesn't matter. What matters is the message. It's kind of like if you're making a, a video, a home movie. Anybody who's made a home, home movie, uh, they, uh, if, they're, if they're filming it on their iPhone, sometimes you'll hear them say like, well, you know, I just wish I could afford a better, nicer camera and get the mic set up and get the lights and all this stuff and all the gear, right? But 
anybody who actually has a successful, maybe it's a YouTube channel or a successful uh, career making movies, they'll tell you the gear doesn't matter. The camera doesn't matter. The story matters. The camera just serves the story. And it's the same way here where the language doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is the message being communicated. Does that make sense? Let's jump down to verse 9. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. This is something that can even happen in English where people are speaking such grand, lofty language. You know, <laughs> the disciples, people were amazed at the disciples because they were unlearned men. They just spoke plainly. They just spoke the, you know, the, the, to, the, to the working class, just the, the very plain speech. Not the, the, I'm thinking of words that James White would use. The, the edification of the distinction, the trans, translation, you know, I, I'm obviously not able to do it. So it's better just to speak for the common man to be understood. And it's something that, you know, some preachers need to kind of scale back. Because, you know, if people can't understand what you're saying, what's the point of it? Even if you're talking about all these different fancy words, you need to speak to be, spo to be understood. Uh, let's go to verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> can you imagine for a second if I got up here and I started preaching this whole sermon to you in a different language that you had no idea what it was? You know, like, you know, Vashta Bushta Dashilai Vashta Vlashla. You'd be like, oh man, <laughs> when is it gonna end? <laughs> but you know, that's exactly what the Catholic Church did for years. They would speak and preach to their people in Latin and nobody understood Latin. And that's the same thing that the, the uh, Muslims do, where they, they have their songs and all that, and, and the language that the common people don't even understand. So what does that do? What does that edify? What does that help them? And for us, it's good in the sense that Catholics are usually very receptive because they don't know their Catholic doctrine. They don't know all that stuff, so it's working for our favor, which is good. But at the same time, if you're preaching something that can't be understood by anybody, there's no point. And many times when I was in the, the vineyard church, what they would do is they would actually just, because they understood nobody is understanding anybody what, what they're saying, they would just do it all at the same time. They, they'd get up and they'd be like, all right, for the next five minutes, you're all going to speak in tongues. Go. And then all of a sudden, you'd be sitting there and the lady next to you would be like, and you'd be like, what the heck's wrong with you? It would just be everybody at once. And they did that because they obviously understood that if they were to get up here and be like, boop de doop de doop de doo you know, be the crickets, like, what are you talking about? What are you saying? You know, that makes no sense. And so let's keep reading here. <clears throat> Jump to, to verse 16. I got to hurry for sake of time. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? Now, this is really interesting. This is talking about praying. When, you, when, when somebody prays, what, what happens when somebody prays? When somebody prays, at the end of the prayer, they say amen. What does amen mean? What's the significance of amen? It generally means it is truth, or I agree, or that's right. It means, you know, I confirm what you're saying. And so if you're ever at a weird, you know, awkward family event or something, and maybe somebody prays some weird prayer, like, you know, they pray like, kill them all, Lord, kill them all, you know, about some people that you don't agree with or some war that you're not agreeing with, don't say amen at the end of the prayer, which is a very, you know, simple concept. But if somebody's praying for something that you don't agree with, hey, I don't, I don't agree with that prayer. Don't say amen. If you say amen, it means, hey, I agree with you. I, you know, count me in. I, I agree with what you say. I double, I double insist, you know, what, that that prayer get answered. And what the Bible is saying here is that if somebody gets up in the church or any other place and they start praying in a different language, how can you say amen if you have no idea what was being said? Now, this actually happened to me back when I was in China. We're in China, and, you know, China, it's a communist country, the Christians there, and, and I have no idea if they're, any, if they're actually saved or not. I don't believe the church I went with was even saved. 
But they're praying, and they're praying very fervently. They're very, very uh, zealously. They're praying, and they're praying, and they're praying. But of course, I can't understand a word they're saying. And they keep praying and praying and praying, but there's a word that they're saying that, to me, it sounds like, woman, woman. And so they're praying, and it sounds to me, because like, I'm, I'm just a teenager, you know, I'm kind of hitting puberty or whatever, and it sounds to me like they're just praying for women. <laughs> woman, 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 woman. And I'm thinking, man, these guys, you know, they must be single. <laughs> they're praying to, to get married. But I, I, it was so, and that's not what they were praying for at all, which they were married, and they were being very oppressed, and they, they were praying for freedom, and they're praying for very noble things, and I don't, I'm assuming that. I have no idea what they were praying for. But unfortunately, to me, it sounded so hilarious to think of all these people praying for women. I'm thinking, you know, what is going on over here? Because that doesn't seem like a, a good prayer to pray. Anyway, because of what was happening, it made me start laughing, which is, it's, and, and it, it's embarrassing. It wasn't a good situation, but they're praying, you know, they're pouring out their hearts to God, just praying, praying, praying. And I'm over here like cracking up, like trying not to laugh. And if you ever are trying to laugh or you're about to laugh and you try to contain it, it makes it even worse. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it makes it even worse. And this is exactly, there's no interpreter. Now, if somebody was interpreting their prayer to me, I mean, I'm just a 14-year-old boy, then maybe it would be like, oh, wow, they're actually praying for some serious things. But to me, it was like, <laughs> you know, trying to hold it in. That's exactly what the Bible's saying to avoid. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding. This is verse 19. That, my, that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. You know, when you're listening to, to people uh, pray in Chinese, it's, you can get to 10,000 words pretty fast. <clears throat> uh, verse, uh, let's jump forward for sake of time. Uh, let's jump down to verse, verse 32. And the, spirits of, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. This is crystal clear. Uh, <clears throat> what this is saying here is that if, if somebody is, you know, freaking out doing their little episode of speaking in tongues in the Pentecostal church and they faint on the ground and they're foaming at the mouth and doing whatever, and they come back and they're like, bro, I wasn't there. I was gone. You know, where have you been? What happened? I don't know, man. That's not of the Holy Spirit. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That means that you're in the driver's seat. You know what's happening. You know what's going on. You're not gone. It's not like, hey, where'd Jake go? Man, you, you weren't there, man. You were gone. No, you're subject to the prophets. And uh, I do want to jump back to verse uh, 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. If there be no interpreter. And believe it or not, this verse is in the NIV. It's in the ESV. It's in whatever stupid version that the Pentecostals and you know, the vineyard and all these other, you know, charismani charismaniac churches uh, use this verse. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. So I was sitting there thinking, you know, there's nobody interpreting any of this. Keep silent. Verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now, I don't want to go into all this, but each one of these churches, in my experience, where we had this, you know, Pentecostal speaking in tongues issue. We also had Pastor Julie and we had Pastor Amy. And isn't it interesting that these things go hand in hand? It's listed right there in verse 34. This is the kind of thing, if, if you have a, a female pastor leading your flock, most likely a couple years you're going to be speaking in tongues, all, you know, the whole church. And verse 37 is the key, because you could say, somebody, you know, I tried to tell my friend this, and he says, well, you know, whatever, I don't believe it, whatever. Verse 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And so what we see here is, is basically the, the Bible's crystal clear. If you're speaking in tongues, you know, that should be another language. If you're speaking in tongues, there should be an interpreter. Now, why does it say at the very end, it says forbid not to speak in tongues? It says forbid not to speak in tongues because of the fact that there are legitimate reasons to bring somebody up before the church. I mean, even in this church, let's say that we had a great mission trip to Guyana. And, you know, a person from Guyana 
comes back here. That's a bad example because they speak English there. But let's say Botswana. We have a great mission trip to Botswana. We bring somebody back. The person wants to speak, but they only speak the, the language of the Botswanians. I don't know what that's called. It's perfectly okay to bring that person up here, let them give a testimony in their own language, and interpret it for the people. This is kind of like the missionary with the slide deck. Maybe you've seen this in the old IFB churches where they have the slide deck, and they bring up the missionary. Usually they're asking for money. But they bring up the missionary, and they're going through the slide deck, uh, showing you all the work that they've been doing back in their country. And they usually don't speak the language of English because they're speaking their native language. That is the appropriate doctrine. That is what the Bible is saying. So what we need to do is run away from false prophets, run away from demon-filled churches. I didn't mention this, but the, the people who are, these churches, they would sing this song, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Well, the people who break the chains in the, in the Bible are the demon-filled people. The people who break the chains. You know, Paul's chains, uh, Paul and Peter, uh, their chains were loosed when they were in prison. <laughs> the angel took the key and loosed them. He didn't break them. <laughs> you know, it's a pet peeve of mine when people say, break every chain. Well, you don't want to break that chain. So what languages are used in heaven? Every language on earth will also be used in heaven. And I'm happy that we have eternal life that so we can learn how to speak all 7,000 of those languages in heaven. I mean, that, what a great goal to have. So I'm preaching this so we can encourage young people to learn a second language and, you know, even learn the second language, that's great, but even more importantly is learn how to edify people and teach the gospel and, and to comfort people. And, you know, that's pretty much the most important thing to do is, is to preach the gospel. And so if you can learn more languages, it opens a whole bunch of doors. And praise God, if you're young, learn another language. If you're old, preach the gospel anyway. Let's pray.